Welcome back to DWeb Decoded, a podcast by Filecoin Foundation that explores the intersection of blockchain and the data economy. I'm your host, Aaron Stanley, and today I'm joined by Adam Rose, who's Chief Operating Officer of Starling Lab. Adam, it's great to have you on the show. Hey, Aaron. Thanks so much for having me on today. Amazing. Uh, so, Adam, you have a super interesting background at the intersection of journalism, media innovation, civil rights. Why don't you tell us a bit about your career journey and how you became interested in these topics? Sure. Well, I had spent about 20 years in um, media and journalism prior to joining Starling and in a variety of roles was really introduced to fascinating things that technology could do for journalists, but could also be done against journalists. And I was working for a large newsroom, uh, which was getting a lot of uh, international attention. And we were bought by a very large corporation, made a lot of headlines, and we had a lot of turnover. So I was dealing with editorial standards, ethics, things like that, which are really important in any newsroom environment. And all of a sudden, uh, because of the changes that were happening in personnel leaving, we needed someone to be a systems administrator. And I had no experience at that whatsoever. So all of a sudden, I'm responsible for you know a thousand Gmail accounts and even more in terms of commenters and bloggers and overseeing teams that are running some of these things, but responsible for decisions that were being made while we were actively being targeted by groups like the Syrian Electric Army or Electronic Army. And um, we also, uh, you know, at that time in the news media environment, we're hearing about Ed Snowden and the um, uh, revelations that came from a lot of his releases, but also the way that journalists were taking their privacy more seriously and their security more seriously, trying to realize that their adversary in the sense of being monitored or um, you know, being targeted were state level actors. So for me, my introduction to this world was actually with cryptography in a defense uh, orientation. And what really opened my eyes was a few years later when I uh, started to meet folks around Starling Lab, uh, I learned that, wait a minute, these same concepts, these same principles, which are invaluable tools for journalists and human rights defenders to protect themselves, these same concepts can be applied in these other ways, which are fascinating and really allow us to build and to develop uh, more reliable information ecosystems to improve the ways that we store and retain data and to figure out better ways to make that accessible. So it turned from a playing defense to going into a more proactive and building phase for me in my career. And uh, I feel really fortunate to get to do that with Starling Lab, uh, which uh, was co-founded by uh, two universities, uh, Stanford's Department of Electrical Engineering and the USC Shoah Foundation. So from that perspective, uh, allows us to do a lot to try and prototype and test these ideas to do really good things for our practice areas, which uh, generally are journalism, law, and history. Amazing, amazing. Yeah, I would love to dive into some of the projects that you guys have been working on over the years. I believe it was well, like 2018, 2019 that you all were founded. Uh, I would love to find out about how you actually like what was your career trajectory to arrive at Starling Lab in the first place? And um, maybe talk about some of the projects that you guys have undertaken uh, while you've been there. Absolutely. So Starling uh, Lab was founded five years ago, a little over now, and it's amazing uh, how much has happened in that period. So uh, I was working for uh, another large media outlet and a colleague from um, a, a previous career, a previous uh, journalism outlet, uh, had been involved with Starling and said, hey, you really should talk to these guys and find out about what they're doing. One of the most interesting projects uh, that got my attention was the work with USC Shoah Foundation to preserve what they call the Visual History Archive. Now, for those not familiar, uh, Shoah is a term for the Holocaust. So the USC Shoah Foundation researches genocide and originally started looking into um, you know, ways to preserve the testimony of survivors and their descendants uh, who uh, had survived the Holocaust, but then also started looking at all the other major uh, conflicts, uh, human you know, atrocities throughout the world, where it's very vital that we bear witness. And unfortunately, a lot of this material is ephemeral when you think about storage mediums. Things decay, things get lost. The same challenge that you and I have with our you know, photos that might be on SD cards from a few years ago or flash drives, well, you know, those may not last nearly as long as, as we expect them to. And, you know, cloud storage providers aren't necessarily reliable. We see all sorts of risks with censorship and things like that. So Starling, before me, was already... Can we put a quick pin in that? Um, yeah. Just on that one point, because this, this is interesting, because this is actually how I first found out about Filecoin, probably about four or five years ago, when you guys were working on this project. And uh, I think I was working as a reporter at the time, and somebody was pitching me this story. And I was like, huh, like, I, like the, 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 the idea that this stuff would have was... Uh, you know, these, these super, this, these valuable pieces of information, these testimonies, these images and whatnot, that there's no reliable way to store these things. I was kind of like, 
wait a minute, what do you mean there's no reliable way to store these? Like, like, like what we were, this is 2021. Or like, what are you talking about? Like, this is, uh, maybe you kind of dive in a bit more into like, just why is this such a, like a pressing, why is this such a problem that still exists in, in the 2020s, right? This seems like this is such important information. These are such important things. Like, like why have we waited this long to like really try to address preserving it? Well, there's a really important line that uh, the um, uh, the CTO and associate dean of both uh, USC Shaw Foundation and USC Libraries often reminds us of, and it's just three words: digitization. Sorry, four words: uh, digitization is not preservation. These are both really vital and valuable things, but they're not one and the same. And so, a lot of people have assumed that when we digitize, there was some aspect of preservation baked in. It's not. Uh, preservation is an entirely different area of practice. Now, they're very interrelated, but they, they don't necessarily uh, work hand in glove the way that you, know, you would hope in a consumer device. You really have to design these systems for uh, you know, the long-term preservation and the authenticity. So you know, as the example with the collection at USC Shoah Foundation, we're talking about, at this point, uh, I think it's over 57,000 testimonies. At the time, it was 55,000, but we're talking about four petabytes of material. I mean, huge amounts of video and, and photo evidence and, and collections. And you know, the ways that we think about consumer devices don't always relate to these really large industry uh, level storage systems, but they also do have some really important parallels. So if you think about the trade-offs that we are willing to accept in our lives, you know, it, people took a, on a lot of trade-offs with using social media and the amount of data collected, and people have traded a lot of convenience and privacy, and there've been a lot of you know, fierce debates about these things, appropriately so. But think about your storage mediums. You know, think about you know LPs and CDs, and uh, you know we had uh, zip drives and HDDs, hard disks with spinning disks in them. Then we went to flash-based uh, SSDs. You know, many of us have you know closets or, or, or drawers full of these old you know thumb drives and technologies that you know we probably haven't plugged them in in ten years and don't even know if they work. They might not. And the trade-offs that came with more space and more speed often were the, the lifespan of these mediums. So as a result, you know, people may have you know, thought they saved their, you know, these photos from their vacation or their family's most cherished moments from uh, you know, 20 years ago on a, on a zip drive, and maybe that doesn't work anymore. Or even if that drive still does, how are you going to find the, the, media, the, the device to plug it into, right? What if that breaks? So there's all these different factors that we have to address. Um, and that's just on the consumer level. Now think about the implications at the grand scale of four petabytes of testimony with 55 to 57,000 people being interviewed. Um, you know, these are things that are vital for human history on a certain level. Uh, and in many cases that Starling is working on, we're looking at evidence uh, you know, and testimonials that will potentially be used in the International Criminal Court or in war crimes tribunals for modern day uh, situations. So to ensure that we preserve them is a really important task. Um, you could think about it maybe in, in the way of a actual crime scene investigator and you think about the way they bag things and go through preservational techniques well those same sorts of concepts really do need to be applied to preservation of anything from you know maybe it's an important family photo to a um you know a, a criminal investigation you know it's cultural heritage any number of things but when it's digital it doesn't mean it's always going to be there no that's really well stated and i i like that line where it's you know preservation is not or sorry, digitization, digitization is not preservation, yeah. right? That, these are these are things that we conflate easily, and it's it's, it's understand to like the layperson, it's kind of obvious, like, well, yeah, you're, you're digitizing it, it's going to live on the internet somewhere, on your computer somewhere, uh, but the other things are totally different things, right? And yeah. uh, you know, you need to solve for each one specifically, otherwise, you know, they're not going to happen automatically on their own. Yeah, well, and a lot of times people don't even ask these questions of their own data. They don't sort of have that moment of self-reflection. When I had actually just started, like the first week I was with Starling, I just happened to be at an event and met a climate scientist from a university in Canada. And you know, his life's work was on uh, you know the, the the changes in temperatures and the Galapagos and all over the world. I mean, fascinating, fascinating stuff, and important for people to understand the implications and what we might do to try and preserve uh, important ecosystems in, in the natural world. And, you know, just chit-chatting over a drink, I, I said, well, that's, uh, you know, really, I mean, first of all, fascinating stuff, but where do you keep that data? And I just remember him saying, oh, it's, you know, uh, stored with the university. And I go, okay, well, but like physically, like where is it? He goes, well, it's in the cloud. And I said, no, no, physically, where is that cloud? And there was this really 
you know, it was a loaded pause. <laughs> it, it was very uncomfortable for Lights, a moment. Uh, deer in the headlights uh, look, right? Like, what do you mean? <laughs> exactly. And this is like a PhD researcher. This is a brilliant human being who's doing a world changing work. But, you know, they're busy. They're thinking about a lot of things and they weren't thinking about where that data was being stored. And he, immediately he said, well, gosh, I'm going to find out, you know, and, and, and make sure I understand how, you know, the, the data practices because I, I don't know. It's just going on in the university cloud. Is that Google? Is that Amazon? Is that Microsoft? Uh, you know, is this, um, you know, what are the policies around it? Could, uh, you know, the government uh, where that data is stored because of where it's geolocated, could they do something to make something inaccessible? Um, what if there's an economic collapse? I mean, there's all these really important questions, which is what people in this ecosystem, uh, you know, are, are trying to address. And you can think about all those different use cases and why it's so important. So let's talk a bit more about some of the other projects that Starling has been working on. You mentioned the, the, the Holocaust Genocide Survivors one. Uh, I know you did a few things around the election in 2020. There were some things around some of the riots and the some of the protests in 2020 as well. Maybe kind of walk us through, um, you know, what other uh, endeavors you guys have been working on, especially in those early years. So Starling has three different practice areas, which uh, I mentioned: journalism law and history. And within those different practice areas, we have different approaches to try and implement in the real world uh, prototypes that are clearly uh, valuable within these ecosystems. And we want to show the value of these. So my own background being in journalism, uh, you know, I, I really relate strongly to a lot of this work. Uh, one of our first uh, really major projects as a lab uh, is a case study we call 78 Days. And uh, the team here worked with Reuters, uh, the big international uh, news agency and one of the leaders in global news, which was out there with their photographers documenting uh, the transition between uh, Donald Trump and Joe Biden. And as you know, many folks remember, that also includes uh, January 6th and everything that happened there. So just a coincidence of timing that you know, several of the, the journalists who were out there, whether it was covering everything from you know, the election day itself to that incident to the actual swearing in of, of uh, Biden, they were carrying cameras, which uh, had uh, prototype software installed. And we were able as a team to uh, develop a system where on the camera, as a photo was taken, the moment light hits glass, and a term that folks may want to become familiar with is glass to glass authentication. The idea that you know, light hits the, 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 the lens, goes to the sensor, and then all the way to the screen that it's coming off of when you're you know, consuming that, whether it's your laptop, your phone, whatever it may be. So uh, those uh, cameras were tethered to uh, cell phones with a secure enclave, you know, essentially a wallet. And uh, it's probably people in this audience will be familiar with. And so the idea was that as those photos were taken, uh, they could be cryptographically signed. And so we were then able to take those hashes and register them on blockchains. And that created a uh, digital paper trail, uh, which helped to establish not only that the you know, pixels were the original pixels as registered, but that also the metadata uh, hadn't been changed. So that 100 years from now, someone could hand you a Maybe it's a zip disk. I don't think that'll still be around. Maybe it's some kind of thumb drive. Maybe it's a CD that's lasted that long. But it doesn't, uh, you know, it could be any form. It could be uh, over the internet, uh, emailed to you. And you could get a copy of that photo and its metadata. You can hash it yourself using these, uh, you know, uh, freely available uh, algorithms. And you can see that if the hashes match, uh, like a digital fingerprint, that you do have the original material that was captured on January 6th in Washington, D.C. So that is a really important thing from, you know, uh, the, the sense of knowing what is real in this day and age, especially of generative AI and deep fakes. So that was a really, uh, you know, just amazing set of circumstances coming together in that particular case study. And we've continued to do that across any number of other projects. Another really important one for us, uh, we did with Rolling Stone, and there's a piece called The DJ and the War Crimes, which looked into an incident from 30 years ago in Bayelina, Bosnia. And what I really love about this from a technical standpoint is that it's not just saying, hey, we have this whiz-bang technology on these phones and, you know, uh, and cameras from today, but we went back to 30-year-old slides film slides. And we worked with the original photographer. And one of his images it was a famous iconic photo uh, of a, what appeared to be a war crime being committed of a soldier kicking a dying woman in, in, uh, on the ground. And um, the suspect had never really been widely identified. And there was a lot to that story itself, which is a, an amazing read in Rolling Stone. Um, if uh, folks go to investigation.rollingstone.com, I think it's the first thing that, that comes up. So um, the underlying imagery, though, that one photo had been used as part Part of uh, you know, especially cheap fakes over the years, people would circulate the photo and say, as recently as the last few years, and say, "Oh, this is a, um, a, a Ukrainian soldier 
kicking a civilian in uh, the Donbass region. And it wasn't, right? That was a, a Serbian uh, you know, paramilitary soldier kicking a, a Bosnian woman you know, almost 30 years prior at that point. But that's what circulated online, right? So getting people to the original version was important and having attestations around that was also important. So not only did we uh, preserve that image with attestations from the photographer, Ron Haviv, who did amazing work uh, in the field there in, in Bailina, Bosnia, but also other photos from that day, collections of evidence that came from social media about the people who were involved in that paramilitary unit and identifying not only the person, but the web of people around them that helped to facilitate uh, you know, not only what happened in that day, but even more recently, some of the folks involved in that investigation were identified as supporting Russia's invasion of Crimea. Um, so all of this was collected and preserved using these sorts of approaches. And then, of course, it was uh, securely stored uh, using decentralized storage. So, you know, that's all on Filecoin, the, the full uh, investigation. And a couple of weeks after that um, story published, the local prosecutors in Serbia uh, announced that they were reopening that case and that they were looking at it. So they confirmed that with local media, which was exactly the point of this, that you can't deny it when it's all been saved and you create all the attestations around it. And it forces people to look. And it forces people to take this seriously. And it forces people to consider the real evidence that they have. So those are the sorts of projects that really um, get us motivated because of the implications for so many people. And of course, the timing of that was fascinating because that story came out within a couple of weeks as well of the rollout of the version of ChatGPT that got the whole world excited about generative mm. AI. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's I suppose that was kind of a light bulb moment for not just you guys, but for for everybody. That was the wake up call that everybody had that this, this AI stuff that's previously just been science fiction or, you know, you know, some kind of you know weird like Google experiment or something like this is real. Uh, we have the ability to create this content to to, you know, manipulate content. And it's it's literally like anybody can basically do this now, like, a you know, a teenager in their basement could could create these things and manipulate these things. How, how did that kind of change like i mean i mean I, i'm assuming it's valid it's validating to the work that you guys were doing but how did that change the perception of what you were doing right did this go from being maybe like oh that's kind of cute these guys are experimenting at stanford with this thing to oh wow like we need something like this uh in the world of ai i think wake up call is really the perfect term it sort of uh made people pause to realize that this was going to be the worst that generative ai would ever be and it was already getting really, really good. <laughs> that's that's the thing to remember. I mean, you look at you know some yeah, what was the, the Will Smith eating pasta? You know, it looked terrible, and people are like, ah, oh, this is you know, this is a great you know <laughs> party trick. It's not serious. Well, then when you know ChatGPT really got good, people realized the implications with with text, and then you start looking at you know Midjourney, Stable Diffusion, and all the different models that rolled out. And you know now we have photographs that look like they were taken by professional portrait artists. Um, there, there was uh, a, a version, I think it was of Stable Diffusion that came out recently, where it regressed and added an extra finger on some of these uh, people. But then the, the actual faces look like Jill Greenberg portraits. She's a, a great wow. famous photographer. And of course, they're going to fix the finger part. Um, and of course, it's going to keep getting better. So that was enough that people really went, okay, this this is real. One of the things it also did is, I think, caused some you know, confusion and people are going, okay, well, what are you guys doing with AI? It's like, well, we're not implementing AI into more things. What we're doing is serving as sort of a, a counterpart or a, a way of authenticating things that run in parallel to AI. And we want people to be able to reference back to the originals, right? We don't want to say that AI can't be used or that there's something necessarily wrong with it. There's all kinds of great creative uses of intelligent uses to you know, do things that advance business and that may uh, you know make people's jobs better uh, obviously we worry about the off uh, you know the, the huge risk of people's jobs being lost and what, what it does but there is going to be practical application of this technology like any technology so for us it's not that we're putting AI into these things what instead we're doing is saying how can we get people to the most original version of what they need to inspect in the underlying versions of that so the the history there um, for us is about the history of media and the history of content and knowing that people always want the most original piece of evidence so 
being able to secure that in a system which adds some sense of resilience that you know stores it in a decentralized way um, and also uses blockchain uh, and other types of distributed ledgers to register it uh, ensures that people are going to be able to you know kind of okay hit pause take a breath and look at what is the real version what is the most authentic version they can they can uh, you know use to verify and to then make their own decisions and that's another really important thing here is that throughout all this we've been saying look Starling Lab will not arbitrate what is true and what is false. What we're doing is helping you understand the media that you can trust. I love how you're taking that first principles approach to this, right? Where it kind of goes back to like history class 101, where it's, you know, primary sourcing versus secondary sourcing, right? And if your, your objective is to try to find, get as close to the primary source as you possibly can, uh, because that's going to give you the most accurate uh, information, right? And without that accurate information, it's hard to interpret. It's hard to draw conclusions. And so, what you're you're not really reinventing the wheel here. It's just you're 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 you know polishing the wheel for the digital age, essentially, right? Which I so I, I like how you guys are taking that approach. Where uh, look, like we're not trying to tell you what's true and what's not. We're just trying to give you the verifiable evidence that allows you to make an informed conclusion. Uh, is that is that maybe a, a, a fair way of, of of summarizing that? Absolutely. I think you hit the nail on the head. It, you know, and the other thing I'll remind people, and I often remind people, is that there are permissible edits to media. You know, so it's, um, you know, think about photography. I mean, even the way that a ca- photographer points their camera is a choice. It's an editorial choice about what to include or not include. And in post-processing, there's nothing wrong often with a crop with color correction, right? It's the types of edits that are problematic. So not only do we need to think about, um, you know, having the most original version of a photo, but we need to think about allowing people to trace back through that history. So in that Rolling Stone story, as there are in other pieces that we've done, there are essentially audit trails uh, where you can look at the version history of certain images. And when you go back through that, you see, oh, okay, well, this was just cropped in. Uh, they got rid of the edge, you know, when we digitize those film slides, as an example, there's a paper border around uh, the actual film slide. So that was cropped out. Uh, there was color correction because certain uh, versions of the images came in a little bit too dark or maybe a little bit too light, but we didn't radically change anything. We didn't put a bayonet in someone's hand. And so you can inspect that going all the way back. The same principles often need to be applied to uh, you know any number of news or legal-based photography, right? You know, if you can't see it because uh, it's too dark or because the you know, colors are, in, or, you know, it's blown out, you know, to, it's too bright. Well, okay. And that it's going to be permissible on some level, but um, we need to be sure that people can verify that against that more original version. So another one of the signature projects that you all have worked on is with Ukraine. And I remember this fairly vividly just because I was spending quite a bit of time with Jonathan Doten, uh, who's the, the founder of Starling Lab uh, in, in the spring of 2022 when the, the Ukraine war was breaking out. And it, it kind of struck me, uh, it, it, what you guys are doing really became real to me at that point because you know, this whole idea of like over preserving kind of historical information and, you know, genocide survivor testimonies, things like that stuff happened a long time ago, but it's important. But the Ukraine thing was like, okay, this is happening now. And, you know, war is obviously right. What's that, that, that phrase where it's like, the truth is always the first casualty of war. Right. So it's like, you don't know who to believe it's all, you know, you don't know what, you know, both sides are being force fed propaganda. We don't know what's true. We don't know what's going on. And uh, so when I found out that you guys were on the ground or you had you had, you know, journalists or, or researchers on the ground who were uh, trying to catalog uh, evidence of some of the the, the the crimes and the activities that were happening there, that 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 really hit home to me. I was like, wow, this is this is like the work that humanity needs right now at this point in time. Uh, I would love for you to talk a bit about what what, um, you know, what that project entailed and and also, you know, I mean, just from just from like, did you guys kind of have that same sentiment as well? We're like, you're like, okay, this is game time now. Like, this is happening now in our like, this is our jam. Like, we got to nail this. Like, this like humanity is depending on us to get this right. It, that's exactly right. It was a sense of urgency, and it, it was a sense of this is the here and now, and, and the the great you know proving ground for a lot of these technologies. At the same time, we also recognize that while there's urgency to capture the evidence. There was going to need to be a lot of patience in the actual outcomes in terms of accountability. And keep in mind that you know war crimes can take 
decades to prosecute. What we're really talking about is transitional justice, where people generations later, who are maybe the kids at the time, are the ones who are going to need to make decisions about what is the right form of accountability, what is the right uh, you know, form of, of making people whole again, and what are the systems that we all use for that. So we had to think about their needs, uh, not today, not tomorrow, but you know, 20, 30 years down the line. So in order to do that, we actually took on a number of different projects with, uh, within Ukraine and surrounding uh, with information surrounding Ukraine. So just as an example of uh, one specific one, we uh, worked with the Atlantic Council's Digital Forensic Research Lab, and they did an amazing job uh, uh, researching over 10,000 pages of um, of what could essentially in some cases be considered propaganda, but uh, essentially Russian sites and blogs talking about the war uh, and the, what was appearing to be misinformation. So think about link rot. You know, think about the idea that the U.S. Supreme Court has cited new websites which are no longer up. Uh, think about uh, you know the, the huge rate of link rot on uh, news sites. The New York Times, this has been well studied. Um, you can maybe see some charts here about the, the rate of decay of links uh, and deep links within articles. You know, if websites are going to disappear and websites are evidence of about, let's say some sort of organized misinformation campaign and you know coming out of Russia. Well, it, it's important to preserve that and to capture it properly. So we used a tool called Web Recorder, uh, which uh, comes from people in the uh, the Web3 community and the the Filecoin community as well, um, and use that to capture uh, these 10,000 pages and then preserve them so that they would be available for researchers looking into mis and disinformation. And then you sh- uh, you pivot to what's actually happening in the field. One of our really big concerns is, as I mentioned, children and the idea that it's their you know, future that is, is being torn apart by some of these uh, really violent and aggressive military actions. Well, one thing I think that everyone can agree on is that the target, targeting of civilians is a war crime. And one of the things that you know, really stood out about the early days of that conflict was the bombing of schools. You know, there's no reason to target civilian infrastructure where children are, especially when there's no military around. So what about potential future claims that military would be around? And what happens to the, the evidence of that physical scene when it gets torn down? Because, well, of course, they're going to rebuild. I mean, that's, that's a good thing. That's what we want is for this area to be rebuilt. But then how can you confirm what happened? Well, obviously, there's photography. But now... This day and age, we've got the liar's dividend, right? Where people will deny that something is real and then it sows these seeds of doubt. And we've seen it domestically in US court cases already where uh, you know, lawyers have tried to exclude evidence saying, oh, well, this could be deep fake. So what do you do? Well, in our case, we applied uh, what we call the Starling framework. And it's a way to think holistically about the life cycle of an information asset, whether that's a phone number, an encyclopedia, or a, a photograph. And you think about how it's captured, uh, how it's stored, and then uh, you know how you verify that, and so the verify step can you know cross back on the others. And these these are not necessarily sequential, though they often are. So in order to properly capture things, we had teams uh, that we were working with on the ground in Ukraine taking photographs of uh, a school that had been targeted, and this is an apparent war crime, of course. So very serious stuff. We were using uh, technologies like Proof Mode, uh, another uh, tool that some folks may be familiar with. And what's great about that is, as opposed to needing a, um, you know, let's say a professional camera with, you know, software that's tethered to a, a phone or some of the devices now, which use what's called C2PA, really great development as a as a technical standard, uh, and you can get cameras now, professional cameras with C2PA on board that helps to authenticate at source and on device and to show what the original is. But it's early days right now, so some of these are like ten thousand dollar cameras, as opposed to proof mode, which and by the way, these are all great things, but it's just for which audience. So proof mode, it's free. Anyone with an iPhone, anyone with an Android can just install it. And so, uh, you know, in taking that, uh, which comes from uh, the Guardian Project um, and some other great folks in this ecosystem, uh, we then captured a number of these images. Then, of course, stored them using Filecoin and other uh, decentralized storage systems. And then, of course, collected a lot of metadata and verification data. And often in our projects, we will register on seven or eight different blockchains or distributed ledgers that allow us to say, well, even if one somehow were to fail for some reason, the redundancy assures that we have uh, registered versions of this material so that 
you know, years from now, when prosecutors are trying to understand what to believe from an era full of generative AI, or you know, even something that is just manually edited into a, a fake, um, that they're able to say, okay, well, this is reliable evidence that we can authenticate and that we can introduce uh, into uh, a courtroom setting. So. Our lab actually submitted uh, a number of these to, uh, as, as dossiers to the uh, ICC, the uh, prosecutors there at the International Criminal Court, um, and also to uh, reports that were produced for the uh, UN Human Rights Council, which wound up citing this as an emerging good practice for the documentation of war crimes. So those are the sorts of things where we see these really profound humanitarian implications that, while they might be in an early phase today, are practical. They can be applied, and they, in the long term, will lead to these, uh, what we hope are really robust resolutions and, and upholding of civil rights. Yeah, no, very well said. Um, so I'd like to say congratulations and thank you, <laughs> I guess, on behalf of uh, humanity for, for doing this work. I mean, I think it's just really incredible, uh, really incredible that you're doing this. So, you know, it's just, it's 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 amazing that we have not, not just the technology, but like the people that are willing to put in, you know, the, the boots on the ground and we're willing to put in the effort to be able to do this. Um, so maybe just kind of wrapping up here, I would love to talk a bit about what's on the horizon for Starling. Like, what are you guys up to like next six, 12 months ish? I know we've got elections coming up this year, uh, which is kind of a hot topic, especially there's been, you know, kind of a rise in generative AI and deep fakes and things, not just in the U S but other places. Uh, that has been has been kind of capturing some of the conversation, um, but would love your thoughts on that. And then uh, any other projects that we should be paying attention to out of Starling. Yeah. Well, first, I'll say that we stand on the shoulders of giants here in, in the sense of the information ecosystem. Um, many of these principles and concepts uh, trace their roots to the 50s and 60s and uh, ideas of a decentralized web and applications of cryptography. So we're just trying to take that to a, a different place and a different level in certain uh, you know, practical implementations. But you know, some of these, I, I first always want to remind people and, and ask people to share this idea that, look, even cryptography, is it's not like it's this brand new thing. I mean, we've got, you know, uh, four or 5,000 years of history with ciphers. And there's something called the Caesar cipher for a reason. You know, the Jefferson disk or the Jefferson wheel is named after Thomas Jefferson. I mean, these are not, you know, new, weird, emerging things. These are, you know, really well-grounded, well-tested concepts that are now being applied in these ways. So to that point, one of the things that we're really looking at as a lab uh, is how we spread that knowledge and understanding of where, you know, people sit in the information ecosystem. So we've got uh, classes being taught at uh, Stanford uh, University. Uh, there was a, a course there, there called Designing for Authenticity last uh, year, which is actually expanding in scope. And, and so there's more uh, teaching going on in the university setting. We're also looking at professional training and how we expand that and try and reach people who are working in those different practice areas to help them understand and be uh, good stewards of that information ecosystem. So along with that, we continue also our practical applied projects, our different fellowships. Uh, in the journalism space, we uh, are wrapping up right now a great project with uh, Numbers, uh, another part of this uh, this ecosystem. Uh, they're based in Taiwan. And so they uh, worked with a number of journalists, uh, photojournalists on the ground who were photographing the election in Taiwan and um, using uh, their technologies and also applying some of Starling's approaches to uh, you know authenticate the original photography that was taken. We're developing a, a tool or a system, really, I should say, called Authenticated Attributes, which allows people to uh, self-publish uh, almost like a feed of metadata around different uh, assets and associate assets, assets with each other. So we were working with a number of uh, these photojournalists from Taiwan on that. So we'll be releasing a case study coming up soon uh, on that work. We're also uh, working with, a, uh, as an example, a really great photo director uh, who's been with a lot of major national publications and and uh, is looking at the uh, role of archiving with photojournalists uh, who've seen amazing history, but maybe their personal archives, you know, aren't being preserved in the best, most efficient way right now. You know, what happens uh, when that photographer is no longer there and we lose the collection, uh, you know, as an example, a great uh, a conflict correspondent or work uh, photographer, uh, Christopher Morris, who's photographed Panama, Croatia, um, you know, the Philippines, uh, January 6th, he was 
was there, uh, you know, the, the, the coup in Russia, all of these things over the years, you know, he's witnessed history, his lens has witnessed history. And a lot of this stuff is sitting on hard drives, you know, in, in his home in Florida, you know, a hurricane comes along and wipes that out. That's a re- really serious risk. So one of the things we're looking at is the, the role of digitization in collections like that and the role of preservation, right? Looking at these two things, which as you may have, have recognized here, map very closely to the idea of capture and the idea of store. And then, of course, we're adding all this verification as well. So we're, we're really looking at the archiving of journalism right now, uh, both photography, but also you know, old print media. Um, and so there, we'll, we'll have some exciting things coming along there. And um, you know, one other thing I, I do want to flag as people are thinking you know, very uh, actively about, say, deep fakes and, and those similar sorts of risks is that you know, the misinformation that we're concerned about is not just, say, in a political sense, but just in a basic scam sense. How do you know that the person on the other end of this call that we're having, the versions that people have like a Zoom, um, how do you know that that's really the person there, that you can really believe that the pixels are the real pixels. And, you know, just recently in the New York Times, there was some really in-depth coverage about people who fell for deep fakes of Elon Musk to fall for scams about investing. And so people in in that story uh, lost up to hundreds of thousands of dollars. I think one was nearly, you know, two thirds of a million dollars, the life savings gone. Uh, we have seen celebrities impersonated left and right. Um, we've seen, uh, you know, deep fakes of Tom Hanks promoting uh, teeth whitening and Gail King promoting um, uh, uh, weight loss drugs. And you know, she went on Instagram a few months ago, sort of famously, and was like, "Look, that ain't me. You know, this is this is a fraud." So. The other sorts of work that we're also looking at is how do we uh, you know, think about identity? How do we authenticate who's real? And how do we support that both as we collect and store information for historical purposes and for journalism purposes, but even potentially in real time? Amazing. Adam, really inspiring work that you're doing at Starling. So congrats to you and the team. Uh, keep up the good work. And uh, really want to thank you for coming on the show today. How can folks get in touch or learn more about Starling if, uh, if, if their interest has been piqued here? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, look for us on a lot of the normal uh, kind of social media uh, channels. Our website is starlinglab.org. Um, our, we've got a YouTube, we've got a LinkedIn, we've got a Substack. Um, you know, we've, we're, we're on a lot of uh, the, sort of the, the, the usual suspects there. So uh, if you, uh, you know, run a search for Starling Lab, I have a feeling you'll find us. Amazing. All right, Adam, thanks so much for your time today, and thanks to everyone for listening. Thanks, Aaron. It's been a pleasure.